deserve it. I'm a woman, I'm a mother. I'm a sister, I'm an aunt, I'm a wife. I deserve happiness, not pain. I deserve to be loved, not to be beaten. I deserve to be free. I deserve to be a woman, not a slave. My heart is big as an apple. My soul is as deep as two oceans. My smile is as bright as nothing. My freedom is the freedom of the nation. Let me be the woman I deserve to be. Thank you. The HIV virus responsible for the global AIDS pandemic does not hesitate, but it does discriminate. It takes advantage of people that are least empowered to make the right choices. Among its favourite targets, the poor, the uneducated, the misinformed and sadly women. And they had five girls. And in our traditional setting, girls do not constitute to, you know, children as such. So these parents died, left five girls. The oldest was 16 and the youngest was barely four years old. Now, the night before the father was buried, the uncles chased the girls away from the home. Why? Because these are girls, they need to be chased away so that they can inherit the land that the father has left. Because the girls are not supposed to remain in the homestead, they should go and the, the uncles can take up the land. So whatever the, the parents owned, they should be taken away. The girls never, I'm not supposed to inherit anything traditionally from my father. Although the Kenyan law now uh, has provision that every child has equal right to, to inheritance. So these girls were chased away. It's the neighbors who realized that these girls are, have been chased away. And out of the outcry, uh, the, the local administrator uh, got together with the, the neighbors and the friends and were able to enforce, you know, uh, on, you know that these children should be allowed to stay in the home and they, they had a right. Women are biologically, culturally, socially and economically vulnerable to HIV and AIDS. But women are fighting back and are taking initiative. We are challenging the stigma and discrimination faced by women and family members living with HIV and AIDS. We are lobbying for research and for better care. And we are pressing our leaders to make AIDS, and in particular its impact on women, a priority. We want to turn the tide. But how do you get millions of people, that means every single one of us, to individually change our behaviour? And in the case of women, all too often it is not our own behaviour that puts us at risk. First, let's re-examine and adapt cultural practices which fuel the epidemic to the new reality of AIDS in our society. We also need initiatives and community support to build socio-economic environments that allow us to make wiser lifestyle choices. We even have to change the way we make love to ensure it's safe for us, for our partners and for our children and we definitely take care of those already infected. We may not have all the answers, and none of them will immediately stop the pandemic. But one thing is certain, women are leading change with ideas and concrete action, one step at a time, one issue at a time, and one woman at a time. Making decisions requires empowerment, the ability to say yes, no, maybe. But the reality is that many women are in no position to make choices. They are still fighting for their rights. Women still feel disadvantaged, even especially the young women because of lack of education. So they still are at the lowest spectrum of society. I mean, their inequality in work, in education, and it flows over into their sexual relationship. Yes, in the era of space exploration and advanced technology, many women still have to demand and struggle for the right to education, land ownership or business ownership, not to mention basic access to health. When a woman lives in a society where cultural and religious taboos deny her the same rights as her husband, she can't tell him to put on a condom. You are still having women, most of them they don't have that to right or a say in the sexuality. 
sometimes they don't have a choice. If the men feel like to have sex and they're in their relationship, it's, 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 it's one of the cultural, it's perceived as a cultural role. Women must have the freedom to choose. Together with men, women have to build safer and healthier communities. A country or society cannot make progress in any sphere if half of its population is not given equal rights to participate and protect themselves. Governments and communities must recognize and uphold women's rights. Decisions are also based on culture. To respect traditions and to do things that will please our family and community is natural. But what if those practices encourage the spread of a deadly virus? Times have changed. My grandparents did not have TV, portable phones or condoms. I do. The choices I make today on how to use these affects not just my lifestyle, but future generations as well. I believe that women, especially mothers, can be the first to change culture. As challenging as it may be, we can help our children to talk openly about sex. An informed child is far better equipped to handle challenges, including HIV. As mothers, women can in fact challenge a host of outdated customs. But to do so, we need to be well informed about the issues. And we need the support of our partners in this effort. Husbands, brothers, community leaders. Together we can challenge the traditions that have allowed HIV to spread. Opinion leaders have a responsibility to use their influence to fight HIV AIDS. The most popular girl in her class, a business owner, a first lady, an actress or a singer. When these people do something, others easily follow. For this reason, we must encourage partnerships with opinion leaders. Let us work with them to take advantage of what their celebrity status can do to save lives. I got involved um, with the issue of AIDS a few years ago um, when I heard the appalling statistic that 90% of people who suffer from AIDS live in sub-Saharan Africa actually and 90% of the resources are spent in the developed world which was like being hit over the head with a bottle um, and so I started to travel to try and um, educate myself about what was really going on and during those travels principally in Uganda and Mozambique I discovered that most of the frontline people as it were in the trenches of the AIDS battle were women um, dispossessed for one reason or another perhaps because they had been infected by their husbands um, who had then left because women generally speaking do get blamed for bringing the infection into the household or for instance even in one case I met a woman who had once asked her husband to wear a condom at which point he, he vamoosed. So um, I realised that the disease, which is a global emergency of enormous proportion and the greatest catastrophe that has really um, faced the human race in our entire history, the greatest disease catastrophe, um, was impacting women and children um, even more than men and that we really did need to address that and from my own perspective I, I'm an, an artist if to use rather a grand word for well an actor and a writer which is what I do I'm a communicator and I think that um, all artists are tremendously useful in such a battle. There are many people um, suffering from this disease who have no voice and we have louder voices than most because we're big mouths and because the media will give us attention. So I, I would call upon all all artists um, to come and help because I don't think honestly that this is an emergency that anyone can sit back and ignore. I think we all have to be active. Um, personally I don't want to have to say to my four-year-old daughter in 20 years time when she asked me what I did in reaction to the worst human catastrophe in memory. Um, I just would prefer not to have to say nothing. Is it right for a 65-year-old man to marry a 15-year-old girl? Is it right for us to accept it? 
Granted, to many families it may be a convenient or even necessary means of ensuring a daughter's future. But even without passing judgment, in highly affected areas, older men are likely to be HIV positive. Unfortunately, some men believe that having sex with a virgin cures AIDS. This belief leads to the abuse of children, young girls and nuns. This is completely a misguided belief and has to disappear. Furthermore, younger girls, in addition to being biologically more vulnerable, are definitely less likely to understand the importance of safe sex or have the ability to insist on it. Some girls want to study so badly that they agree to have sex with older men to pay for their tuition. It happens more than people think. These men pay young girls to be their girlfriends. Even the ones who stay in school see this as their only funding option. There must be better ways of supporting the dreams and ambitions of our youth. I remember in high school being ridiculed and really laughed at my classmates in A-levels because the clothes I was wearing were not considered the in thing. And uh, the girls, I remember the girl who really ridiculed me had uh, a very rich sugar daddy. And so she had everything that she needed to have. So it was really very common. Widow inheritance, a common cultural practice in many places in Africa, has the potential of spreading HIV and AIDS. Originally, widow inheritance was meant to ensure a woman's security and her continued relationship with her extended family. A relative of the dead husband was therefore entrusted with both sexual and economic responsibility over the widow. The problem is that the HIV positive husband who died will likely have infected his wife, who will now infect her next husband, who may have the potential to pass it on further. In countries like my own, it has become common among younger generations to have many sexual partners during our lifetime. This is a personal choice for each one of us to make, but with that choice comes responsibility. For those that are sexually active, getting tested to know your status, being faithful to one partner and having sex with a condom are the only safe options for protecting ourselves and our partners from HIV. I'm angry at um, men who live lives that endanger many women without taking their own responsibility for their behaviour. Men who know that they or who may not even know that they're HIV positive, but they know that today there is HIV uh, virus and it's dangerous to have several partners without taking the necessary precaution if they must persist with their behavior. I get angry because they're being irresponsible. They are infecting many because every partner they, they interact with is going to infect others. Generally, you cannot tell if your partner has AIDS from just looking at them. For this reason, many community groups, associations, clinics, hospitals, and even countries have started voluntary, anonymous, and free HIV testing and counseling. Information campaigns to help people understand the importance of testing and counseling are absolutely essential. All women, regardless of age, race or culture should take advantage of testing and counseling options. Go now, don't hesitate, and encourage your partners to do so as well. Beyond voluntary sex, we enter the arena of sex work. When it is a choice, sex work is a difficult decision. When it is forced, it is a crime. In either case, such women operate in difficult and dangerous circumstances. We have legalised prostitution in our country, um, but the Prostitutes Collective and a number of other groups have been, and a lot of the um, brothel keepers, I mean, it is mandatory 
for condoms to be used. But there are incidents now of um, women who are operating freelance, etc., are sometimes being very badly beaten and abused because they've insisted on a condom. And as regards HIV AIDS, one infected sex worker can spread the virus to many men each night. What communities need to do is to find ways of integrating these women and provide them with alternative means of livelihood. Trafficking of women for the sex industry is very profitable for organized crime. For several decades, the women's movement has been protesting against this trade, but only recently have some governments begun to react, sometimes not so much to protect the exploited women and girls, but more for their own reasons of security. Trafficking in women must be stopped. Governments must identify the criminal rings that run this trade. National information and education campaigns must be initiated. Trafficking in human beings must be made a criminal offense in all countries. Religion has been the basis of great cultural traditions for centuries. However, not all religious practices are compatible with modern realities. Some dogma go against modern medical findings. Other dogma do not uphold women's rights. We must change these practices knowing that these changes do not in any way diminish one's personal faith, but they can save lives. We need to work more closely with faith-based organizations. Encouragingly, many are now tackling issues of stigma and discrimination and addressing the issues of children living with HIV or orphaned by AIDS. But we also need religions to acknowledge and explore all aspects of this pandemic, including prevention and access to care for all people living with the virus. It does not matter how people become infected. This is a disease. It is not a sin or a punishment. Certain cultural practices such as female circumcision are clearly harmful to the health of women and girls. Female circumcision, practiced in some African communities, is clearly a genital mutilation. It permanently damages the reproductive system of the woman. From an HIV standpoint, female genital mutilation is also dangerous because it is usually practiced in unsanitary conditions and with shared instruments that spread the virus. The system that continually requires that women damage themselves to be socially accepted violates their human rights. I was young. I was probably nine years old. I was scared for it. I didn't know what it entailed, but I knew that part of my body was going to be cut off. And my mom was scared too, but it was part of the society. It had to be done. So when it came to that, it's usually done at Christmas time, December is the longest holiday. The, the girls of the same age in that village had to, 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 to go through that on one day. So it, I was informed on a Saturday night that it's going to, it was going to be done the, the following day. And I remember I didn't sleep. I was so scared. I was so scared. So we were woken up very early in the morning before dawn. And we were, I don't remember how many we were, but all I know is that I walked there as a zombie. And when you, it was done under very traditional circumstances. And I remember screaming. And I remember the torture. So it's something that I promised. I never went back there. Traditionally, you every year you will join in with the others to take the next group every year, but I never went back there. So it's something that I still remember very vividly how it happened. And that split second using a raw knife, which is, you know, even not a knife that you buy sharp from the, from the, from the shop. So it's something that has very, very vivid uh, it's very vivid in my mind. Female genital mutilation practitioners are well respected in their societies. National and local authorities must find ways of retraining them into new occupations. We 
establish that women need the freedom to make choices. Women who are raped, beaten and otherwise threatened cannot make these choices. They are scared. They no longer have the ability or even the motivation to demand safe sex. They are afraid to go for an HIV test. The stigma attached to AIDS is sometimes worse than being diagnosed with the disease itself. There is one thing common between rape and HIV AIDS. Not only is your body violated, but also the spirit. Victims of violation need our support, not our moral judgments. One lady, she called the police and the lady who was being beaten, she refused to talk, talk, talk open because she was afraid of the guy. And the case was closed. Sexual crimes are the most horrendous acts of violence against women because they demean women in every imaginable way. And yet, sexual crimes are most often committed by trusted people such as husbands, close family members, or friends. Sexual crimes against women must be prosecuted. Uh, if, if the men will stop beating their wife, they'll be, their family will never, never break. It will grow like a family tree. And a real man never beats his wife, never. Leadership starts at home. Mothers and fathers value your daughters and encourage them to participate in civic life. We have so much to give. I call upon all the young girls of the world to believe in our ability to lead change. I also call upon men to see the value of having strong women by their side. Isn't teamwork a true and tested concept? Isn't two better than one and a half? Women are half of the world's population. Women make scientific breakthroughs, build business empires, and lead countries. We also give birth to and raise all of humanity. Why then aren't we more present in national, regional, and local government? First and foremost, I would continue what they're doing and expand what they're doing, which is to let every little girl know that she is precious, she is valuable and she is equal. Because if you look at the world, that is a message that hasn't really caught on yet in most parts. So first you have to know you've got a power and you've got a value inside yourself and that your life ought not be trivialized or made less valuable by the society. But really what I was doing was learning that inside every woman is a power. And it's a power not just to react to the boys or to the men in your life. I think many men misunderstand what we mean by the empowerment of women. They see it as competition. I see it as collaboration. By now, I hope the point is clear. Women, young and old, need resources to fight AIDS. Poverty, ignorance, discrimination and sex work increase our vulnerability. We cannot keep waiting for social conditions to improve, hoping that an affordable cure for AIDS will come soon. We have to help ourselves. Women need to catalyze change in their own lives and communities. Do, do women in Pakistan talk about sex openly? No, I mean, we don't even have a word for sex in our yeah. language, in, in, my, in my language Urdu. We don't have a casual word for sex, um, unless it's in the context of adultery. Yeah. So it's hard for men and women to talk about it. But women, on the whole, are more aware of contraceptive use, mostly because the responsibility of contraception is considered to be a woman's responsibility, not so much as a man's responsibility. Did you talk about sex with your mother? Very late in life, yeah. very late. I think I was uh, 16 after I had read about uh, the reproductive organs in class 10. Yeah. Um, it's not the, the normal thing 
for even women to talk to their daughters about sex and, and what it means. So you got most of your sex education from school? It wasn't sex education, it was more biology, right. if I may say so. <laughs> um, it was in the context of biology and uh, we didn't know what sex was until in college we began to see that there were girls who were dating. Much can be done at the community level to help improve women's wealth. Economic self-reliance enables people to make choices. This in itself is empowering. For women to benefit from economic independence, they must have access to property, land ownership and skills. Women also need to access funding and credit in order for them to make progress in business and entrepreneurship. Case in point, women have proven their credibility. They are by far the most responsible borrowers, consistently paying back their loans. Economic independence for women is extremely important in the fight against HIV and AIDS because among other things, it gives women the confidence to make choices, including to negotiate safer sex. Schooling creates rigor, it builds friendships, and it establishes the foundations of equality. We need to fund it. We need to encourage children to finish it. We need to make sure their learning environment is safe. And in addition to traditional curricula, we should teach our kids job-oriented skills. I am one of the lucky ones. I was given the opportunity to explore and pursue my ambitions all the way through university. I know that many girls are not so lucky. I know some leave school because they cannot afford it or because their family needs additional income. For example, when a father or mother has died of AIDS. I know I am fortunate. And I know I have a responsibility towards those who are less fortunate. A country's progress can be measured by its government's investment in the education of its people. Increasing security budgets at the expense of educational ones is ultimately an investment in insecurity. Formal education on HIV and AIDS is essential, but society at large, including adults of all ages, needs to know the truth. There are still too many misconceptions about HIV and AIDS. I don't think the information is out there. No. Um, we talk about it around the 1st of December because it is uh, World AIDS Day, but during the rest of the year, there isn't that much out there in the media that I, you know, I, no, I can anywhere. see. I, I mean, agree. you can see it in the doctor's waiting room. There's a pamphlet or two or a poster. But then even in our own countries where we keep saying AIDS, 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 but then maybe they're not addressing some of the misconceptions and just getting out the basic information over and over and over so people can learn. No, but as you say, it comes from Africa and so on. So to us, it's so far away. But it's also we don't here. think it's going to. I know. It's also here. I know. But when, when you see, you read it in the papers, you only read about Africa. You only read about places where they have lots of cases. But you don't read about cases in your own country, and it's something terrible happened. Because when I went to school in Austria, I mean, this topic was completely taboo. You didn't talk about it. I personally don't know anybody that has openly said they are HIV positive. Yeah, that something exists, but it's far away from my personal life. Yeah, you don't see any, you don't see your neighbors or anybody. I mean, if you live, depending where you live in a neighborhood, personally, I don't know anybody who's HIV. I'd say that women are less likely to get AIDS than men because they're less promiscuous than men in general. Well, yes, women are more vulnerable in getting AIDS because uh, um, I think they don't have this, uh, a man can say no, a woman sometimes it's very difficult saying no and they think when you, when you say no, it means yes. Those who understand HIV and AIDS should share with others what they know. Peer counselling, for example, is showing results in Southern Africa. There, young people that are better informed share their knowledge with kids their own age. 
I was very curious. I was very curious because I haven't heard of the approach before. And she told us that it was based on some research that actually revealed that young people prefer to talk to fellow young people. And I could relate to that because at that point in time with my fellow friends at the university, I really preferred to share all my problems, happiness or whatever it was with them rather than with elderly uh, persons. After we were trained as trainers, we, we had to go to different schools in, in Kadatura to start off the training of peer counsellors. So we were paired in two, and my friend of, and myself were assigned to Jan Jonker um, Secondary School. Um, and for some reason, I don't know, maybe because of the way we presented the program to the young people, they were also just, a, we had a huge group of, of young people. When I joined the, the Y in my fourth year to do my internship, um, I think that was the time when we started to develop a, a curricula on, on HIV AIDS because then we decided that it is really a need. There's this taboo thing still about sex and sexuality and it's a fact that our young people do not have open relationships with their parents or elderly persons to talk about issues around sexuality. If you can talk to a friend, your classmate that you can trust about issues around um, sexuality, HIV, and you are sure that that person will give you the correct factual information, then why not? Because if peer counselors are not there, then young people would go to fellow friends, yes, but who may be uninformed and who could really give them the total, total opposite um, information when it comes to the contraction of HIV and AIDS. Like for example, if you have had sex with someone who, who, is, who you think is HIV positive or who is HIV positive, you can just take a shower and just rinse yourself there and voila, you know, the virus will be gone. You know, such kind of, of myths exist. In all fairness, many governments have spent time and money publicizing the dangers of HIV and AIDS. But many AIDS campaigns don't speak the language of the targeted audience. Kids have their own symbolism, as do older people, and yes, women do too. Education also happens at home, and not just table manners. Sex, as well as drugs and alcohol, must be discussed. Youngsters want to know the truth the problem is, they don't know who to ask. Parents obviously know the details, but they're not willing to discuss them with their children. Mothers, aunts, older sisters and friends, teachers about sex, reproductive organs, pleasure without multiple partners, pregnancy, contraception and sexually transmitted infections. Instead of trying to stop the pandemic by preaching no sex, teachers about good sex and how to protect ourselves. We have talked about the root causes of HIV and AIDS. We have looked at ways of avoiding the virus. But the reality is that tens of millions of people, tens of millions, are living with HIV and AIDS right now. Women all over the world, maybe your sister or neighbour, wake up every morning to the reality of the disease. Those with access to sophisticated healthcare are slightly luckier. For them, daily life is easier. But for the rest, healthcare and drugs are an illusion. Pharmaceuticals need people to be alive to buy their drugs. If they had more people alive buying aspirin, they would make much more profit than if they had millions of people dead. All over the world right now, there are HIV positive women that are unable to obtain a test, unable to get care, unable to gain access to drugs. Sometimes it is the government's fault, other times it's a financial issue. At times, community stigma simply keeps them away. What are all responsible parties waiting for? We need antiretrovirals. We need support for home-based care. We need free and anonymous testing and counseling. I'm sorry. But this really makes me angry. To think that nations are willing to fund millions of dollars to wage war, but only their loose change to make drugs available to HIV positive people. Where are our values? Can governments, pharmaceutical firms and businesses not see that HIV positive people need affordable care and treatment? 
Can such a smart species not see the value of its own survival? Truth is a scary thing. Speaking out can be hard, especially when someone is HIV positive. They don't want anyone else to know about it. But silence and denial only feeds ignorance. We can no longer afford to remain silent. We're all infected and affected by this pandemic. Our stories need to be heard so that more and more women have the courage to speak out. Families, friends, our openness will help a person living with HIV AIDS to come out of denial. Unfortunately, however, women that are open about their HIV status are sometimes cast aside, they're made to feel guilty, they're sometimes beaten and even killed. It's very, it's very, very bad because what happened is the Jamaican society, because of a certain degree of lack of education about the whole HIV issue, what you find happening is that if men have it, then you're so stigmatized by the society as being homosexuals because they believe that once you're homosexual, that's how you have the virus. So once the men have it, then they're seen, seen as a homosexual. The women, once they have it, then they see, oh, they were a prostitute. Yes, stigma is an ugly concept. It implies that someone is a scar, a blemish, a disgrace. Yet women living with HIV AIDS are no different than before. They are the same caring, productive and intelligent beings that came onto this earth. Women, don't hide. We need you. Why do you think there's so much stigma and prejudice against people that have AIDS when people find out? It's fear. Fear. Yeah, because I think from the very, from the beginning, it was, it was perceived as highly contagious and the wrong information was given. Um, like for example, in the early cases of children with AIDS in schools in the States, for example, how the parents of other children um, demanded that that child be uh, expelled and, um, you know, which is a, an abomination when you think about it. But how would, just because the information was not given correctly um, and those, other parents feared for their own children. I don't see if there was any danger just having a friend that's HIV positive. Stigma costs more than integration. A working person living with HIV or AIDS generates revenues for medicines and care. Women have always been the world's healers. We bring families, tribes and nations together. We can fight stigma. We can embrace people living with HIV AIDS. One such shining light is Azanath. My brother died uh, in May and the wife died in around August. It was really hard. Um, one of the sons was sitting for a major national exam. By then they knew. Um, I'm the one who went to pick him from school and I had to tell him. And it was difficult for them to recognize that yes, the father had died, and now the mother, they knew it was imminent, it was coming. And you could see the sense of insecurity. They were thrown out of their own house, they went from one rental house to the other, and we were the ones who were trying to support them. One thing I've come to realize, it's very difficult to care for orphans. And I feel so bad and angry with the this real that at least one parent cannot remain to care for their children. It's like they are angry that they are orphans and they don't know how to direct this anger. So it's like everybody, inclusive, everybody inclusive, is responsible for the loss of their parents. Seeing him, of course, they could see him as he deteriorated physically. And it was always very, very disheartening and they could cry, they could, they were very strong. Um, stressed. We must do it, but it is true, caring for a family member with AIDS is stressful, expensive and requires support. It takes commitment, time and effort. Finding volunteers to help is difficult when many are themselves faced with similar situations and poverty. 
governments and other institutions should provide appropriate care facilities for AIDS patients who are unable to obtain care at home, thus supporting communities and families that are already overstretched. When a child falls and cuts herself, we react. We want to know if the child is all right. The same is true for someone who's lost their job. Do we stop caring or do we encourage them to carry on? Let's not treat women living with HIV and AIDS any differently. They need our concern and support. They do not deserve neglect. My only worry is about the small girl who is five years. She's still very far and she needs somebody to support her. So I actually don't know what what will happen to her. So I'm still going around looking for people who can foster her when I'm not around. Those who are ill must also be encouraged to take care of themselves. Faced with a deadly disease, it is easy to lose hope. Please, if you're infected, don't neglect yourself. Stick with your treatment. You have so much to give to your family and to your community. Through you, they can see hope. Without you, they too will lose it. One thing governments and organizations have realized is that a proper use of condoms can prevent sexually transmitted infections. Getting a sustainable supply chain to remote desert towns is a challenge. Urban dwellers, including those responsible for policy, forget that distant rural areas do not have condom distribution channels. This said, NGOs are working hard with governments to ensure broad distribution. Condoms should also be reimbursed by the national healthcare systems. Condoms are one of the few weapons women and men have against HIV and a long list of other sexually transmitted infections. As for men who think condoms are uncool, unmanly or uncomfortable, take a visit to the local graveyard and you'll see that a grave is much more uncomfortable. For me in Brazil, I think on teenager age or maybe twenties, I remember that we were maybe three friends and we were so curious to see a condom. And we, but we wanted to go to this drugstore and nobody had courage to go in there and ask for a condom. And finally we did, but we felt late, later we felt good, but we were so uh, ashamed to do that. I think female control prevention methods are extremely important because of the situation that women find themselves in most of the developing world, that if they have to depend on partner cooperation, they can be in serious trouble because their partner is either not willing to communicate honestly um, with, uh, with their women or their women partners about what their situation is, and women are not in the position to demand that uh, the, their, the with whom and when and how they have sex, they're not in a position to demand um, uh, that that be made safer than it is. So female control methods are extremely important. There are two major um, options for female control methods. Uh, one is with us now and one is coming. The one that's with us now is the female condom. The problem with the female condom is that the current recommendation is that it cannot be reused and we're in a vicious circle where we don't have the demand isn't high enough to make the price low enough. But it's there, sex workers are using it um, in some countries and it, it seems to work well. The problem is that you can't do it without your partner knowing. I mean, your partner is going to know you're using a female condom. This is where microbicides come in, where the, the real potential of microbicides is they can be used by women without partner cooperation. Now, in an ideal world, um, we wouldn't have to worry about that because, of course, we would want honest, open communication between partners and agreement on how sex is going to take place and what protection methods are going to be used. But as I said, for most women, in the world right now, that's not an option. So to have a method where women could use something, they could make their own decision and use it without their partner having to agree, that would be an enormous step forward. The good news is that 
we know that we can get a microbicide to work. Um, and there are many, uh, this, there are many trials, there's five effectiveness trials underway now. That's the good news. The bad news is we're still probably about five years away from having an effective microbicide that can be mass distributed. And we're about uh, $700 million short of what we, rec what we think it will cost to really get a microbicide on the market. So what do we do now while the scientific community seeks a remedy? And by we, I mean all of us. From governments, through multilateral organisations and NGOs, right down to caring citizens, ordinary people like you and me. For starters, we definitely continue disseminating information. We help keep children in school. We provide women with the right combination of resources and opportunities to protect themselves from infection. We reduce stigma and discrimination by creating environments in which women will seek information, testing, treatment and support. Condoms, we keep them coming. I could go on. The point is that understanding the situation in which women live and knowing that we could actually change it for the better should cause rage, not despair. It should spur action, not denial. How can we stand by and do nothing? I have the trouble in matching the words of the leaders to the actions that they take and to the funding that they give to their words. We have an emergency on our hands. We are talking about a single most deadly epidemic in recent human history. A pandemic that has already killed millions and is showing no signs of retreat. The only choice is to make prevention and care our priority. No, I don't have the answer. And if, if I was in their place, what would I do different? I ask myself, what would I do different? I somehow feel that HIV AIDS requires to go back to what the economics uh, uh, used to do when they go back to the zero budgeting and zero thinking and then begin from there, begin really again from a clean slate of saying, here we are in our thinking about the economy of this country, the education of this country, the health of this country. How can we be able to run an education system in the era of HIV AIDS? How shall we run a church, a mosque, a religious group in the era of HIV AIDS, that we would look at it in the, and ask new questions. HIV AIDS is not a television news story. It is in our lives all around us. AIDS ravages families and friends worldwide. If you are positive, don't be silent. Your courage and hope can become someone else's courage and hope too. My hope is that both men and women will join together in a common effort to get tested, to know their status, to delay sex, or to have safe sex with a condom. Always. I don't know when a cure will come, but I have faith in humanity. I believe that those of us who care can create a tidal wave of hope. If this film, for instance, can touch just a few thousand of you, then maybe with your efforts, a few thousand more will be touched. And soon enough, my tidal wave will come. Thank you.